Uh, good morning or afternoon, everyone. Um, and first of all, thanks to whoever swapped with me to do today, because I was supposed to be on tomorrow um, to, uh, to talk about this, but unfortunately something came up. So um, last year we um, acquired... How do I move forward? Here we go. A um, little bit of history about um, uh, BTTV. So we've been trying to... Um, as some of our competitors have tried to get into our broadband market, we've tried to get into their TV market. Um, <laughs> And lots of pension funds are getting rich out of it. Um, so um, if, if I look at um, our attempts at that, we've probably had three real attempts at, getting, at doing something in TV. And, and actually, it's really difficult, probably more difficult than um, people think. Um, and I have probably a new level of appreciation for people who do TV well, and some of the guys from the BBC in particular. Um, so we started off with BT Vision uh, in 2006, which was based on a Microsoft platform uh, that, that I think Ericsson have somehow acquired. Um, and it's pretty straightforward, simple menu, and pretty much more or less on demand with an aerial that did um, kind of digital, what we call digital TV um, when it was first when, when it first started when we first started to move to, to digital TV. Um, we then moved to something a bit more advanced, um, which is actually based on an open platform that we created. Uh, actually ran on embedded Linux, um, we, and we created a new set-top box and moved away from Media Room, which was the, the Microsoft product. And then um, a couple of years ago, uh, working with some partners, uh, we, we worked as part of the UView consortium. Um, and of the stuff we did, uh, we're using H you know, HDTV for our um, on-demand content. So as well as watching normal, TV, normal linear TV, we had a bunch of on-demand content, um, movies and um, all sorts of stuff. And then something and then really inspired what, by what happened in the Olympics. So if, if you remember four years ago, we had this small event um, out in Stratford. Um, where we were the, the network host for the Olympics, um, we really started to think about actually could we do more uh, in this space uh, and more. And there was a real buzz in the company about doing the Olympics, um, a lot of pride, and, and it went went really well actually. Um, so coming out of that, we, we kind of started to think about okay, what could we do in, in TV? Um, and this is just an example of, of our kind of setup today. And actually, the home hub's a bit out of date. We have a new hub uh, uh, called Smart Hub Six, but um, we wanted to get to a much more full um, kind of TV solution, both for single rooms and multi rooms. And at the same time, we we wanted to invest. So we already had invested in the rights for Premier League uh, football. Uh, for those of you that aren't sure, football is the sport where you're paid a lot of money and you chase a ball. Um, and and um, I only watch the World Cup because I love seeing England lose. Um, Scotland rarely makes it. It's a great great place to say that, actually. I can get away with saying it here in Scotland. Um, and I was very sad to see Wales lose against England, which is actually the biggest network event, the second biggest network event we've ever had in BT. I'll talk about that a bit later on. Um, so we acquired the rights to the Champions League um, from ITV and I think it was Sky were the other guys who used to show it and, and we were the only um, TV company that would do the European um, football rights, so it's Champions League, Europa League. And we decided, you know, we were trying to figure out some kind of things to add to that um, and, and, you know, 4K was kind of on the fringe of getting to a place where you could deliver it. and. Um, and probably actually we thought it was going to be easier than it probably actually was in the end. Um, so, um, and then we, we didn't want to just do that. And this is kind of a, I'm a, I used to buy home cinema choice for, for hi-fi gear for years. And it's great to have your own product in it and score quite high. I'm quite proud of that. And the, and the guys who worked on this did a, did a great job. But what we decided to do was we'd have a kind of a 4K focus and we work with Netflix uh, to embed their 4K stuff into our platform um, and we launched a TV channel called BT Sport Ultra HD um, and we offered this as part of the, uh, the rollout of the, the European Champions League. Um, and you know that sounds really easy, everyone's thinking, oh yeah, just get a new box and plug it in. Actually it's not that easy. Um, you've got to get a camera or a, or a source that can take the HD signal. Um, and you've got to process it, you've got to, and, and in BT we 
um, deliver our TV, I think, in five ways. We deliver it on the Sky platform, we deliver it via Virgin, we deliver it on our own platform, we deliver it online, and we deliver it through F Freeview. So we kept it simple. Um, and, um, and clearly there was some difficulties doing UHD on other people's platforms, so we initially focused on our own platform. Um, and our first event that we did was just over a year ago, um, the FA Community Shield, um, Arsenal and Chelsea, um, and, and actually a lot of people were shocked by that result. Um, I didn't care either way. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, um, but, you know, it, it starts with the camera um, and finding cameras, and actually I think that was one area where um, even the six months before, the availability of cameras and, and the, the infrastructure to do this was, you'd have these cameras with these most horrific cable setups uh, to do UHD, and they were just, you know, just the operator to, to work them, and I'm not an expert in that space at all, I, I hasten to add, probably Brandon can tell more about that, but, it, but they were not um, events that would be good for following a football round a, round a football, feed, a, a football field, I would suggest. Um, so here's all the things that we had to think about. Um, from the stadium to our studio, um, and, and if you ever get a chance, we have a, a phenomenal YouTube video on, or, um, about the build of our studio. It's, a, it's a, uh, one of those time-lapse videos that shows how we built it, and it's in the place where the, the uh, Olympic uh, Media Centre was, um, and we've been upgrading it and, and, and doing lots of cool things to it. And it's one of the largest TV studios in Europe now. Um, we had to then get it to play out, some of which we do ourselves, some of which we work with partners on, um, putting in advertising, all the other hooks and, and details you need in our TV signal. We then need to switch it, a lot of which we do ourselves as BT, so we, so pretty, I think, and I don't know if this is how accurate this is, but you know, greater than half of all the TV in the UK um, passes through BT Tower, because um, we do a lot of TV um, broadcast services for um, broadcasters ourselves and, and, and many of our um, uh, competitors as well. And then I, I mentioned about distribution, satellite cable, over the top broadband. And we distribute via Akamai, uh, who do a great job for us, uh, and, uh, and, and we distribute through our own CDN. And then we've got to get it to the TV. And here's the other challenge. Not all 4K TVs are equal. Um, and the number of irate customers we had on, but my TV was definitely 4K, and sorry, it's not, um, is, is, a, is a tricky situation. Actually, we spent a lot of time testing TVs to ensure that they would work. Um, and and you you know I can remember being thinking about it, thinking testing TVs. It feels like I've gone back. You know, we're launching color. It just felt it felt kind of plainly wrong that in this day of interoperability we would have to do that sort of testing. Um, we had to build a load of stuff um, to carry 4K. So we typically use a we have a, a fleet of outside broadcast vans. We had to build a specific one for 4K with a load of special equipment. Some of which, frankly. I would, I would probably argue that we bought it knowing that it might not have a long shelf life because the, the movement in 4K with um, all the different protocols and, and standards and it was moving at pace. Actually, it turns out we've done better on that than, than we perhaps believed at the start. Um, you know, so everyone, you go into a 4K TV store now, you'll see people talk about high dynamic range and a bunch of other 4K features that some of which aren't even standardised yet. In fact, some of the HDR stuff, I think there's two standards for, yet there's TVs in the shops today that claim that they support them both, and I'm pretty sure that they don't. Um, I think there's only really one TV that does, which is a, an LG OLED one. So a whole lot of specific equipment. It was very bleeding edge at the time. Um, a big investment, uh, north of a few million pounds just for a, for a van um, full of flashing lights. Um, and this talks a bit more about it. So we're using Sony cameras, um, Sony UHD server um, and, and a, a, bun a bunch of other control systems um, to, to basically line all this stuff up on. So, you know, it's not just the camera, you've got to plug it into something, then you've got to have it in a gallery that people can then manipulate it and look at it and switch between it. Um, and and it's, it's, it's pretty significant. 
Um, and and this this kit's big, heavy, um, and and you need the experts to drive it as well, which is which is challenging. So we also we work a little bit with uh, Timeline TV, who did a fantastic job for us. Um, here's just some more pictures of the um, the kind of uh, t inside the kind of the van. Not, I mean, it kind of it always reminds me. Well, I've been in it once. It's kind of like being in a CSI van when they're on a stakeout. It's, it's, um, there's a lot of interesting things to look at, um, and a lot of. I mean, the key thing in the van that we're really doing is monitoring that what's happening and what's going through the van is actually doing what it's supposed to do. So half the equipment is more about monitoring than it is about doing anything else. And then that plugs into our network, usually fiber. In this case, we were using um, effectively a, a setup where we had, um, we were multiplexing um, SDI over fiber. And we did look at IP and actually we kind of discounted that very quickly for the reasons we discounted it. The guys in the BBC did a great presentation at the last UK NOF that explains why, I, why 4K and IP is actually quite difficult. But, but I believe it's the right end journey. Um, and then in the studio, um, you need to have UHD contribution. You need to make sure that, the, that you're getting the picture to your consumer and that this says the right thing. So is it saying the right name on the bottom of the screen when you're interviewing Josie Mourinho? Um, is it um, going to the, the right control rooms? Um, are all the pictures of the right quality? Um, a lot of things that you, that you know you, you take for granted in the because in the old world because it's kind of been there forever, whereas now you've actually got to almost rebuild everything from scratch. And again, Sony, we, we worked quite closely with them. Um, we had to uplift a lot of the the studio as well because all of a sudden you've got a, a new level of resolution. So we were actually quite fortunate in our studio because it's fairly modern. We had LED lighting um, and a, and a lot of modern things in it, but even some of the things that we had there, I mean the cameras for example, we had to change um, and we had to kind of chain, we had to kind of lay out some, some things in the studio that worked well before um, to, to, to actually give a, a kind of a, if you like, a 4K wow. Actually the stuff that we had looked okay, but we wanted to give it a bit more of a wow. And, and also we were, because we were now doing more channels and more simultaneous broadcasting, we needed to have kind of more places to effectively uh, run the studio segments from. Uh, and then you've got to get it, you know, through all of this stuff um, to the TV. So um, we have a BT broadcast access circuit uh, th through an encoder over BT Infinity Broadband. When we carry all this traffic and multicast through our hub to, a, to our new uh, set-top box, so we also had to build a new set-top box and let me tell you, that's probably one of the most difficult tasks I've ever been involved with, which is, is building a set-top box, because they have to be super cheap, and they're highly complicated boxes. Um, here are some of the, the, the details in the, in the, in the format. 10-bit, um, uh, HEVC 10-bit, it's quite, um, easy to say. Really difficult to get something that's really 10-bit clean through the start of the transmission, where you're taking it in, right to where you actually deliver it. Uh, and that was one of our biggest challenges because we kept finding th things that weren't as, as uh, clean as they should be. And then you also, the other thing we need to do is ensure that we've got a solution for content protection because the, right, the people who we acquire these rights from are very um, particular about that. And then we have to put it into BT UView uh, so, uh, and, and work with the UView guys um, and you know, put in some specific monitoring um, to, the, to the end user. <laughs> Uh, this is our H set-top box. I won't go into this uh, too much. I'll call out the kind of key things, which was making sure it supported HEVC, obviously. Uh, we also put Dolby Digital Plus in there um, and a new logo saying it was UHD. Um, and um, HDMI 2 with, with uh, card protection. Um, again, a lot of this stuff was kind of quite new at the time. Um, in, um, given we started this really... Um, probably six months before we launched. Um, and then when we put some other features in for future use, such as um, USB, which um, we still haven't really turned into a, a use case for that yet. Um, and, and actually, I think over time, USB on a set-top box makes less sense. Um, what were the big challenges? Um, 
first of all, bandwidth. Um, a UHD um, signal requires a lot of bandwidth. And again, I'll refer to the presentation the BBC guys did a few weeks, uh, the last UK North, because it really highlights that. Um, and you have to split them, we had to split the image into four quadrants so we could carry over our existing infrastructure because we didn't want to rip everything out from our own media network, uh, which we, we run a specific UK wide media network. Um, we're having to compress things um, with very low latency. Bear in mind, football, people are watching football and they're also on Twitter. And nine times out of ten, they, get, they know about the goal first because of Twitter than because of what they saw on the screen. It's one of my pet frustrations. And anyone who solves that problem, you know, we need a time distortion loop or something that slows everything down so that you see it on the TV before you see it on Twitter. Um, it, it, it drives, it drives me um, quick. I think they take care of that themselves every now and again, actually, um, by all accounts. But yeah, I mean, and, and it's not just Twitter, it's Facebook, it's, 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 it's a lot of things. You know, it takes time to get a signal from a uh, football stadium, you have to compress it, do stuff with it, recompress it, put it to play out, then put it to, to, to the distribution network. And that all takes time. And, and you know, we've got a big focus to try and optimise that. And, and I think we're down to, I think the gap's about 24, 25 seconds, depending on the, on the, on the service. Um, it is worst, sorry, I should add. Um, and then we have to make it all redundant. Um, let me tell you, there's nothing worse than missing the last five minutes of a football match. It kind of upsets people in ways uh, I could learn from, um, frankly. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you, uh, so, one of the things I'm, that, that we're really, really keen to do is, you know, broadcast work. And it's something that's kind of, you know, I've had to learn a lot about. And I've, fortunately for me, I've got some fantastic experts that, that do this day in, day out. Um, but actually trying to get more, um, more towards IP and, 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 and use native IP to deliver this. And actually, we, we, we kind of probably gave up on that quite early on because it was just going to be too hard to do. So we're using SDI over IP, which, which you know, we've done for years, but not at this kind of bandwidth level. Um, and and then as, as the guys said in the last presentation, there's a whole load of kind of historic TV stuff like blank, um, you know, a blank um, gap in the picture, um, a whole lot of ancillary data that in, in the old days of TV was quite valuable, in the new days is probably less valuable. Um, and, then, and then, you know, you look at when we use SDI, you, you're chucking away a huge amount of bandwidth that today we don't actually need. But in order to make everything work, we had to kind of, we had to keep it and, and deal with that. So, we're still trying to figure out how we how we move to that all IP world, and and you know I think everyone is, but it, it it's it's non-trivial and and a lot of um, a lot of focus uh, moving forward to do that. Um, distribution, so we're using uh, OpenReach Broadcast Access product, um, and we use a, a head end the, our own head end for distributing on the network. Um, actually, this is where we were quite fortunate and we were able to use the same stuff we already had for the rest of BT TV. Um, I mentioned about making everything truly 10-bit. Um, that was very difficult. And even when things are saying they're 10-bit, they weren't. Um, and then the, other, the, the biggest challenge, we had to build some of our own test tools because you couldn't buy a tester to test stuff. You know, we're kind of reliant upon Fluke or Spirit or, or Aris or some of these other guys coming out with stuff that you can use to test things and actually for 4k stuff and 10-bit stuff that that wasn't really there um and then so um and then the final thing was the tvs um i mentioned this kind of earlier um there's a lot of tvs out there that um the early 4k tvs would not work with with what we were doing and actually not just with what and, and we grabbed a couple of other products on the market mostly um pcs to try and figure out you know, what would work and what wouldn't work. And, and actually there was a guy at TV Connect last year that did a presentation on this, um, where actually we'd, we'd, we'd done a lot better on this than I thought we'd done with TV, TVs working, but we did have some that didn't. Um, you've got to be able to, and, and, thing, and, and the typical issue we saw was things like, we'd support our picture in 60 hertz, but not in 50 hertz. Um, and, and, you know, because most of the rest of the world, uh, 60 hertz is used. 
Um, so you get all sorts of kind of weird things going on. Or the TV says it's displaying an 8, 4K picture and actually it's not. Um, that was one of, one of a really kind of big frustration. Um, most TVs from 2015, thank the Lord, have been fine. So where, where we started to get volume in UHD TVs, um, we've actually been okay. The interesting thing is, is a lot of people have bought TVs in 2015 and before that effectively are going to be not as not what they need to do things like that high dynamic range, um, which I'll comment. I haven't got a slide on this, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it later on. Um, so summary: the great news is we launched it on time because the, the time the time is kind of the first match. Um, so we, the test match was the the um, Community Shield, and then we went live for. Um, the Champions League and some other big Premier League games. We pretty much did one um, UHD event a week, sometimes two, and that's limited because the, the, the kind of outside broadcast equipment, um, there wasn't a lot of it. Um, so we were able to, we weren't able to do every, um, sol every place we might wanted to have done it. We did uh, MotoGP um, last year. I think we did it this year, but I'm not 100% not sure about that. At Silverstone. Um, and we've still got a lot of work to do to move to all IP um, and, and there's, much, there's many more ad advantages in HD and other technologies to, to, that will leverage um, our 10-bit HEVC coding where we think we can get more channels and less bandwidth with the same quality. And, and one of the things that, that I haven't looked into this in some depth recently, a lot, there's a big push for 4K resolution, I would argue, with my eyes, that a 1080p picture with high dynamic range can look better than a 4K picture. Um, and that presents us with some interesting challenges and pr potentially some interesting market dis decisions. Um, you know, people buy often not on the basis of what actually is the best thing, but the fact that it's got a logo on it or a claim on it. Um, and I think that's going to be an interesting set of challenges for. You know, all of all the broadcasters and, and TV providers over the next uh, couple of years, uh, but I genuinely think um, you know, and, and you, you've also got UHD Blu-ray now, um, and, and I've seen a, a picture of um, the last Star Trek movie on UHD, and also with a high dynamic range, ten, with much less resolution. I genuinely thought, and this was a, a the Pepsi test. I didn't know which one was which. I genuinely thought the 1080p one was better. Um, and I think that's it. So early days in this journey, we're, we're looking at um, doing a lot more with this technology this year and trying to add more quality um, and better pictures for um, BT. We also, um, at the same time, put out an app so you can watch online and it's live and works. This is not live, this is MotoGP from the weekend where it rained in Silverstone. Um, but we, we also had to update the app to take new channels and new scheduling and, and also multi-view. We have a view where you can um, pretty much see every um, game that's on at the same time that, that we cover. And that's it. Any questions? Trev. Uh, Keep, hold on. Wait for the mic. I don't think the uh, web viewer in the Isle of Sky will get your projection. Did um, Trev from Lawn App, um, out of interest, did the lawn, did you the number of subscribers you have meet expectations? I didn't think you'd, if I asked you how oh. many you got, you wouldn't tell me. Overall, but. yes. Yeah. Overall, yeah. But, but at 30 megs, uh, there's a hell of a lot of the country won't be able to receive it. Is that right? Yeah. So I think there's, um, well, thanks to our fantastic investment, more and more of the country is able to achieve it. <laughs> <laughs> and if there's anyone else that's willing to invest, Oh, it's gone silent. Um, <laughs> then, then I would encourage them to do so. So, you know, and actually, our, our, I didn't cover this specifically, but actually, we're adaptive. So, if you've got more bandwidth, we'll use it if it's available. But you're right; we need to get more of the country uh, to that speed. And, and you know, my colleagues in OpenReach are working flat out to do that. And I got, I got a supplementary one. I've got four kids, right? And there's a scenario in our house where they're all watching different things on. Different devices we need a retirement different home, Trev, it sounds right. like. And, um, the, so if they're all watching 30 meg streams, right, and we've got, so that you've got whatever 6 times 30 is. Um, like so we all brought Van Roadmap. What do you, what do you, you know, where do you, where do you expect 
what freak, what broadband speeds to be where <laughs> when? In order, because uh, obviously really you need it question. to support it, wouldn't it? That's a really good question, and any number I see now will be wrong. Um, I mean, I think I, you know, I, I think it's. Um, so, and, and maybe if it, so the government are talking about a 10 meg universal um, kind of commitment, um, which is probably what we should have had a few years ago, frankly. I wish we did have. Um, I think it's all about how do we build as much bandwidth as we can most economically and quickly to the people who need it. And that's what we're focused on. Um, but any number I see right now, you know, I'll say, say suppose I say it's, it's, you know, everyone should have 10 gig, right? Nintendo released some game that needs 20. You know, I mean, that, that's, that's the challenge we face. Um, and, and, it's, and it's a challenge that's not going to go away. So you'll see the, the Winter Olympics and the, the Olympics in, in Tokyo, they're doing 8K. Um, you know, and that you know, just makes this problem, you know, at least twice as, worth, what, twice as more difficult, if not more. But then I also look at mobile traffic, for example, where we kind of see that not growing at the rate that we thought it would. Um, so maybe we're kind of getting to a point where people can consume things in only so much time of the day. Um, I think I would like to see a, a way of pushing content more down dynamically. If we think someone's going to watch it, why not push it down when the network's quiet in the middle of the night? Um, it's quite difficult to do that, though, for a variety of reasons. Okay. Uh, Richard Harris, Barclay oh, Community Broadband. Neil. Um, surely there's a, following on from the last question, surely there's a fundamental oxymoron here between this service, which I'm very impressed at the technical capability you're demonstrating in delivering it, but the, fun, the oxymoron is that you're putting, you're the same company that's putting into place a self-limiting broadband infrastructure for the whole country while in, in, insisting that FTTC and copper is an adequate journey into the future for, for an entire nation. That just does not work. Okay. <laughs> So, so I think, um, so if I'd said to you uh, 20 years ago, that same phone line you're running, I'm going to shove 100 meg down it, what would you have said 20 years ago? As long as I was within 100 metres of the other end point. I knew about, we knew about Shannon 20 years no, no, ago, we knew not, about Shannon 50 years ago. That's not a question I asked. The question I asked... I was you, working on a T2 20 you, years ago. Yeah, no, so, but you made a point about the future. Right. What I've come to realise is predicting the future is incredibly difficult, even next week, let alone 20 years from now. You made a comment on the one hand that says we're putting in something that doesn't have a future, yet I'm about to roll out to 10 million homes a platform that will deliver them 500 meg in three years. Can you tell me one other place in the world that has done that to that scale? Uh, yeah, pr pretty much a large part of the rest of the world. To 10 uh, million homes? Uh, Name one country. Much, um, uh, Korea has not done it. Korea, that number Singapore, of for, for various Singapore, parts of the US. Singapore, sorry, to a UK sized country with our no, sort of infrastructure. It's a self limiting architecture you're putting in that ties this country into something that simply does not work to the future, that cannot be scaled, that cannot be upgraded. Other countries are putting in better fibre backbone, even if they're not delivering to premises yet. They're putting in something that is actually scalable into the future, which is something you're patently not doing. I think we so, th therefore, you've got a very nice service here, which actually demonstrates the reason why we don't need BT's current architecture. Sorry, let me... So, you said a self-limiting... Can you explain that point, please? Because I, I, I couldn't disagree with it more. So, first of all, we're, putting in, we're not just building um, cabinets. We're building the fibre infrastructure to get to the cabinets. A session not... Um, a month ago, one of the challenges I heard from many places was there was no fibre to some of the villages or other places which we are building, right? So we are, and we're leveraging the, the, the infrastructure that's there in a way that gives people a much higher speed than anyone else would be able to give them in any short space of time. Okay. Okay, one more question. Uh, sorry, I'm breaking the rules. It's a fact, not a question. Okay. Uh, there are 61 countries in the OECD. Uh, for fibre to the premises, Britain is 61st. Yeah, yeah, sorry, but, but, but can, it, can you take a look at speeds, though? So if I look at Europe, we're number one. It's not rubbish. I, so I tell you, for, in terms, so I, I can show you, and it's not my numbers. 
back in, you know, and sadly this is not what the, what the discussion was about, which is a bit of a shame, but perhaps I'll come back and have this punch up. Um, but but what, what I would say is, what I would say is, I think this is a discussion of, that we need to of, move to the bar. In terms of coverage and take up, we are number one in Europe. And you might not like that, you might not, you might not believe it, but the reality is it's true, and I can present the information, and, and I suggest I'm challenged to do that at the next UK North meeting. Actually, so that's a brilliant, brilliant, it, rather than attack in two directions, how about we use you internal to BT in order to explain to some of the challenges that are being faced in the UK, and maybe we can convince you you could become a champion within the organization. So, so I, think, um, I think I am a champion in the organization. I think, and, and I think a lot of people think we do no fiber. Actually, we've probably got more fiber than everyone else put together to the premise in the UK, right? And because and, and, we don't publish numbers, but I kind of know what they are. And, and I think if, if, if the wall was perfect, um, we would do more with fiber. It's actually quite difficult, as many people will tell you. Um, and, and I've visited all, around, all over the world. Um, and, and, you know, digging a field across a farm when you're kind of a non-profit is really easy. When I turn up to do it, farmer says, oh, yeah, we'll have a piece of that action. Um, there's a lot of challenges in that. So, you know, w when I look at what we've done and what we've achieved, we've, we've, we've given our industry a product to sell that they didn't have to sell before. Because I look at Mal, our main infrastructure competitor, they don't offer a wholesale product, so no one's got anything to sell. Um, is it perfect? Okay, no. Neil, you're over time. Sorry. <laughs> Answering the question.